So maybe we can begin because it's uh, it's time. Uh, so uh, we would like to welcome you, uh, Andrea Armani. Um, you are a professor and uh, you are leading a research lab in uh, USC in uh, Los Angeles. So thank you very much because I know it's very soon in your uh, place. Uh, you are working in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Sciences. Uh, you are currently the Ray Irani Chair in uh, Chemical Engineering and Material Sciences. The research of your lab encompasses several domains uh, from advanced materials, integrated photonics, biomechanical behavior, modeling, and so on. Uh, you are a member of several renowned scientific societies and full member of uh, Sigma Xi. Uh, you also received several awards, uh, both for uh, research and uh, for uh, mentoring. So this conference, without any doubt, will be very inspiring. And thank you again, Andrea, for being here. And um, I am now giving uh, you the floor. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, for having me. Um, I'm going to pop my slides up. There we go. Um, so, hold on. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just to get started, um, I always like to start um, every presentation by thanking all of my students and researchers in the group. Um, they're the ones that actually you know, do all of the hard work. Um, and so I particularly want to thank, in this case, um, Andre Kovac, uh, Renee Zito, um, as well as Lexi Schultz, who actually isn't posted here, uh, and several undergraduate students um, who have now gone on to graduate school. Uh, but they're all doing uh, wonderful things. And I'm very proud of them. Um, as uh, Lawrence mentioned, um, our research spans multiple areas, and I will actually touch on a couple of the different areas today. Uh, I'm going to discuss kind of three different projects. Um, one of them is uh, was a collaboration um, between our group and the medical school that we didn't anticipate. And this is kind of a, an example of how research takes you in new directions, even when you don't anticipate new directions occurring. But the first two projects we planned on. Um, so the first two projects kind of fall nicely into the theme of how optics can really enable biology and medical research. And the first one is looking at kind of the challenge of analyzing tissue without actually doing something called digesting the tissue or breaking it into a bunch of little pieces before trying to understand the structure of it. Um, and then the second one is looking at trying to do malaria screening, which is related to malaria diagnostics, but it's more of like a broad spectrum, a way of looking at detecting malaria. Um, and then the third is doing UVC disinfection. And this came out of obviously the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but also uh, kind of a big, bigger challenge related to uh, how do you clean surfaces uh, because UVC also works with uh, antibacterial um, way of cleaning surfaces. So kind of the first step in doing and developing a diagnostic is basically to pick what you're trying to actually detect. Um, and there are lots of different ways of trying to design a diagnostic. Um, you can think about trying to pick the you know, the building blocks of a biological system that could be trying to detect DNA, RNA, um, different types of antigens or antibodies related to a disease. Um, you could then also think about trying to detect different types of cells, whether it's a cancer cell, um, maybe a, a mutation in a cell or a variant in a cell shape due to a different disease. Um, and then you can also think about, instead of looking at like the building blocks of a person, more like the building. Um, so different uh, defects in an organ or different types of defects in a bone structure um, or different types of organ activity. 
right? So look at changes in how the brain is functioning. Um, so a decrease in activity in the brain. Um, and this is the approach that we decided to take um, in the first project was looking more holistically at tissue structure and its mechanical behavior. Um, obviously, all of these different approaches work for developing a diagnostic, and they all kind of have their own uh, a, like rationale um, in trying to understand how the body works as a system. Um, it's just which way you want to look at it, right? From the, the bottom up or the top down. Um, and the reason why we decided to take kind of the second approach is it is really taking inspiration from, you know, the you know, BC, right, from like 400 BC. Um, and globally, uh, physicians recognize that looking at, you know, kind of the building and changes in tissue structure, uh, you know, play a role in uh, how disease progresses. Uh, and looking at changes in mechanical behavior of tissue really is, is a strong indicator of the presence of disease. You know, so whether you're, you know, like manually palpating or trying to feel if there's a lump um, or just a change in disease or actually doing imaging or you know taking a little tiny piece of tissue and then analyzing its response for a little bit higher precision it's a very accurate way of trying to detect if there is disease present and looking at the mechanical behavior of disease um, is related to all different types of diseases it's not just one specific type um, so it's related to osteoporosis, which is describing if your bones are becoming more brittle. Um, it can be related to cancer, you know, looking at uh, the type of tumor you have or the growth of the tumor or the structure of the tumor, um, which can give indication on which type of uh, therapeutic might be more effective or if surgery is warranted. Um, and then, you know, different types of heart diseases. So, you know, at this a single type of diagnostic can have lots of different applications. And there are lots of different ways of analyzing the mechanical behavior of materials in general, um, maybe not biomaterial specifically, but materials in general. Um, so atomic force microscopy is a, a classic way of looking at you know the nano behavior of materials. Um, again, its resolution is nanometers. Um, one of the limits of using it if we're looking at tissue, um, is that you really need to do something called digesting the tissue, which means taking the tissue and breaking it down into its individual cellular components. But one of the important features of tissue in a biological context is that it's not just cells. So there's this material called the ECM or extracellular matrix, which holds all those different cells together and changes in the ECM are an integral or very important aspect of disease. So if you remove the ECM, then you're losing information. So that's one of the downsides of using AFM. Um, there's also something called a load frame. Uh, a common manufacturer of a load frame is Instron. So sometimes researchers will use the term Instron kind of interchangeably with load frame. Uh, so a load frame is a fabulous way of actually doing this type of measurement. One of the drawbacks of a load frame uh, is that its resolution is centimeters. Um, obviously, cells are more in the micron uh, resolution, and so there's a big disconnect between being able to detect something at the centimeter resolution versus the micron resolution. Uh, but load frames are very well established. Uh, they're actually one of the original ways of characterizing the mechanical behavior of materials. And then there are two uh, ways of using either sound waves um, or a wavelength kind of close to sound waves. Um, and they also have centimeter or micrometer resolution. Um, they're non-destructive, just like a load frame. Um, and they've actually been used in a medical context. Um, for doing imaging, for taking both simultaneous imaging and mechanical information. Um, one of the challenges is that you get subjective information, so more relative. So you can tell if something is uh, harder or stiffer than the tissue next to it, but you don't necessarily get quantitative information. 
And if you don't have quantitative information, then it's hard to, for example, create a library of values. So say if something is, you know, 100 kilopascal, it's indicative of cancer, or if it's you know, 200 kilopascal, it's indicative of aggressive cancer. Um, you can just say it's, you know, 20x, you know, stiffer than the tissue next to it, but that doesn't necessarily, it's hard to correlate that with, you know, an actual diagnostic parameter. Um, so what we were interested in doing is basically trying to take that load frame and be able to increase the resolution of that sensor. So if you take a load frame and kind of take it apart, um, which is always one of my favorite things to do is take an existing instrument and just take it apart. Uh, how the sensor platform works is it's a single plate that has a dash pot sensor and the resolution limit is the size of that single plate. Um, so a straightforward approach for improving this is basically to replace that single plate sensor or that dash pot sensor with a high resolution sensor. Um, and we decided to try to do that first by making an array of optical fibers or basically optical fingers, you know, kind of mimicking the name of using what a physician does, which is their fingertips to actually do a palpation. Uh, so an optical fiber sensor is about 100 microns, which is still a little bit large when compared to the size of uh, an optical cell, but it's significantly better than the centimeter resolution. Um, so our optical fiber sensor is about 100 microns. Um, and how our sensor works is that our optical fibers are polarization maintaining, uh, which means that when you compress them, uh, there's a change in the uh, photoelastic effects of the optical fiber, which then induces a change in the polarization of light. Uh, so if we look at this a little bit more detail, um, polarization maintaining fiber, the specific fiber we use is something called bow tie fiber. Um, bow tie fiber basically has two kind of uh, rods going down uh, the fiber and as well as the obviously core of the fiber, which is where the light is confined. And then uh, in order to maintain the polarization or how you describe the polarization of the light, there's a, a fast and a slow axis. Um, and then when you begin to stress the fiber, you actually end up with a stressed section of the fiber over the area that you're compressing. And that stressed section will experience a polarization change. Um, and depending on the length of the stress section, depending on the amount of uh, pressure that stress section experiences, that will determine the magnitude of that polarization change. Um, since we obviously know the magnitude of force we're applying, because that's a, a known variable, we know the length over which we're applying, we can then back out uh, basically the uh, change that's being induced. This is obviously a lot of math. Um, but seeing as the complexity of the biomaterial is very complicated, um, you know, deconvolving the math suddenly becomes a signal processing challenge, which is much easier to deal with. Um, so you set it up as a series of transfer matrices um, where you have the rotation into the polarization uh, axes. You have the phase accumulated in the unstressed section from the beat length. Uh, you have the phase accumulated in the stress section, which is basically being modified by the fact that you're compressing over a short section. And then you also have the rotation into the polarization maintaining fiber axis, which is just an experimental kind of artifact. Um, in this variable right here, um, this is basically the actual pressure you're applying. And it's important to note that this Y this is actually the Young's modulus of our tissue. So we can directly calculate the Young's modulus of the tissue if we know kind of all the experimental variables of our fiber in our fiber system and how much force we're applying. Um, so the math is straightforward once you have that super long equation. Um, and so just in summary, um, when we apply pressure on the polarization maintaining fiber, the polarization changes uh, due to the photoelastic effect. Um, and the Young's modulus of the sample, which basically describes how elastic the sample is, um, changes and we can determine that. 
And just as a couple kind of simple uh, examples of how this looks in reality, uh, this is a sample of pancreatic tissue um, taken from a pig. Uh, when we compress and relax, so when we apply a pressure and then when we remove the pressure, um, the actual force that we've applied and removed is that black line. So that's basically the signal that's taken from the function generator. And then the response that we measure, uh, so the polarization change, is a blue line. So tissue is something called viscoelastic, which means it doesn't have a perfectly elastic response. So it, there's a slight nonlinear response to pancreatic tissue. And if you take the graph on the left and plot it as the graph on the right, you can see this viscoelastic response very clearly. Um, so this is kind of how you know that our system is working correctly. And then from this viscoelastic behavior, uh, from the kind of this nonlinear response to the viscoelastic behavior, you can calculate the Young's modulus. Um, so since kind of building the system, we've done a lot of analysis. So we first started with fish, fish tissue, so salmon, because it's very easy and very available. Um, it also has a very, it's muscle, so it has a very consistent structure, um, allowing us to make sure that our system worked, um, that if we change the rotation of the salmon tissue, we got a different response, because the Young's modulus is different depending on the axis. Um, we also looked in, the, in a pig model at a whole range of uh, materials, uh, organ systems, so liver, pancreas, colon, heart, lung, uh, and cartilage. And then in human uh, tissue, we're beginning now to look at both healthy and samples that have tumors in them of a few different organs. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on some of our cartilage data, but just as an example, of uh, four different organs uh, going from liver, kidney, pancreas to heart. Uh, if you look at different strain rates, uh, you can see that the viscoelastic response um, clearly changes as you increase the strain rate. Uh, and a, a very common viscoelastic material that people are familiar with is gelatin. Um, so if you think about how fast you compress gelatin, it will have a very different response. Um, and tissue is the same way. Uh, so the, you know, one kind of interesting feature of like the pancreas and the heart is that as you begin to increase, you then see this subsequent decrease. And this is because of actually the complex internal structure of the pancreas. It's not simply um, like aligned fibers. Uh, they actually begin to have a much more complex network and they do something called buckling which we were actually able to model using uh, FEM modeling, which is also kind of an, an interesting project. Um, so then cartilage. Uh, so cartilage, so this is a, a structure or a cartoon of the inside of the knee. Um, this is actually the inside of a pig knee, but the inside of a pig knee is very similar to the inside of a human knee. Um, so there's actually three distinct types of cartilage in a pig knee. Uh, and each type of cartilage has a very specific role in facilitating, in absorbing impact and in facilitating motion. Um, so there's the articular cartilage uh, femoral, um, which is located back here. Um, there's the articular cartilage patella, which is located here. And then these, the, there's the meniscus cartilage, which is located down here. And uh, the, Last one is look, is designed to be a shock absorber. Um, and so it's really basically the primary cushion. Um, the one on the back of the kneecap is designed to absorb both compressive and shear forces. Um, so it's also a shock absorber, but it's a different type of shock absorber. Um, and then the top one is really designed to be a glide. Um, so it's not so much shock absorbing as it is uh, gliding and to reduce strain and stress. Uh, so th this is uh, three examples of uh, compression data on the three different types of cartilage. And you'll notice that even though it does still have kind of that nonlinear response over different strains, there's also there are also many more features to it. Uh, so just to highlight a couple, um, for example, there is this kind of complex 
crossing behavior that occurs at low strains. Um, it still has that kind of bridging behavior. So it goes over at high strains. Um, it also dips. Uh, the um, meniscus cartilage dips at low strains. Uh, so they're, they're obviously much more complex behavior in the cartilage, probably due to the different roles it plays, as well as the very different um, structures inside the cartilage. So we can actually look at all the different possible mechanical behaviors. And so as an example, uh, buckling is one of those. So buckling uh, before all of the cells should be perfectly aligned, parallel to each other. And then after uh, the cells should actually buckle, so they should bend. And on a stress strain curve, this should kind of show up as having these additional bumps uh, as you're compressing. And then as you relax, uh, the bump should again appear. And you know, depending on how many uh, bumps you had going forward, you will have kind of half as many going back. Uh, then you can also have uh, where these parallel uh, cell walls uh, were nicely ordered. You can also have them separate and they can separate reversibly or they can separate permanently. And if they separate permanently, then that's like permanent damage into your cartilage. Um, and if it's irreversible damage, then that is an example of when you, know, you might need to have like knee surgery or something along those lines. Um, but you can have before and after. And if it's after, then that's when you would have a dip in your uh, stress strain curve. And then bridging is when uh, you start off with them, with all of your cells being nicely, per perfectly aligned. And then after you compress, you end up with them being actually bonded together. So they're no longer able to freely move. And that would be a bump, but at very low strain rates. So we can go through and you know, specifically look for that those characteristic indicative bridging points. Um, and we can look at all three types of cartilage and look at if they have that first uh, buckling point, a secondary buckling point, and if they have a buckling point on the unloading curve or when you're removing the pressure. Um, so only the uh, meniscus, and I included the cartoon in the upper left, so only the meniscus cartilage and articular cartilage included two buckling points, um, which makes sense because both of those are designed to be load-bearing. Um, the articular uh, cartilage, the one in the back, only included a single buckling point. Um, when we went to uh, really high, uh, oops, when we went to really, really, really high um, strains, uh, we had, you know, that was the only time we actually had two buckling points. And it's important to note that the really high strains, that was, they're kind of on the the edge of actually being realistic strains. Um, for the most part, they were outside of a normal range. Um, then uh, all of them had unloaded buckling, which indicates that all of them actually were able to recover and they weren't permanently damaged. So now uh, moving on to the uh, malaria screening project. Uh, so the malaria infection cycle, um, you start off with a mosquito um, that's uh, ho uh, being a host for a parasite. Uh, it bites a human. Um, then the mosquito will again bite a human, act as a host. Uh, the parasite will replicate in the mosquito, and then it will go to the next human. Um, so it's a fairly straightforward cycle, which means that if you're trying to think about how to, or strategies to quench a malaria, you basically have strategies that will work in a person. So therapeutics or diagnostics or strategies that will work in the mosquito. Um, so doing genetic engineering of mosquito in, in the entire mosquito population, uh, doing things like pesticides um, or nets. Uh, so just to give kind of a sense of the reach of malaria, 
um, and where it's you know mostly located. Uh, so the incesticide resistant status, um, it's you know very incesticide resistant in Africa as well as large portions of Asia and South Asia. Um, some of the uh, resistant uh, malaria has also reached uh, Central America. Um, so the approach of killing the mosquitoes isn't as effective as it used to be. Um, additionally, it's important to note that you can't just look for the human populations that are symptomatic um, because there is a significant fraction that are asymptomatic, which means that they can still be carriers, um, but they won't necessarily seek treatment, um, which we're also seeing right now in the COVID-19 epidemic is a huge problem. Um, there are two uh, current malaria diagnostics, uh, the RDT, which is the rapid diagnostic test. Uh, this is an antibody-based test. Um, the great thing about it is that it's very user-friendly. It gives quick results. Um, the downside is that the reliability is governed by uh, its storage. So it is an antibody-based test. So there are kind of stringent storage requirements. Um, which aren't always accessible everywhere. Uh, then the second approach is imaging. So you take a small sample of blood, put it on a microscope slide, and then count the number of malaria infected blood cells. So this is obviously very manually intensive and also very uh, reliant on the accuracy of the technician actually doing the reading of the blood cells. Um, so, but that, that approach works very well if it's done correctly, um, but it's the opposite of quick results. Um, but both of these have problems detecting low levels of parasitemia and therapeutics are most effective when someone is diagnosed early and with low levels. Additionally, they both require a person to actually go into a physician's office um, and ask to be detected. Um, Therefore, our approach and our thought was, you know, if we can develop a population-based screening system um, that, you know, we could just screen everybody as opposed to only detecting and only trying to uh, diagnose those who actually seek help, then it might be much more effective because it would allow us to, you know, kind of catch those asymptomatic uh, carriers. Um, so, you know, step one, find a biomarker. Um, so when you look at, uh, kind of the different possible biomarkers, um, the first two, uh, biomarkers in the kind of the phase of when the, uh, the parasite begins to infect red blood cells are the, that ring formation, which is what you pick up in microscopy, as well as the generation of antibodies. And that happens about 12 hours 12 to 18 hours um, after parasite infection. But then about 18 to 24 hours after parasite infection, um, hemozoin begins to get produced. And hemozoin could be another uh, possible uh, biomarker. So then the question is like, what is hemozoin? Um, so how hemozoin works, and I'll go into what exactly it is in a second. Uh, so, what happens? Uh, so the parasite remains in the liver, um, reproducing until it is released into the bloodstream. Then uh, free heme is generated as a byproduct of the uh, hemoglobin consumption by the parasite. Then the heme, right, and heme is kind of the main product in the red blood cell. The heme is aggregated uh, into a little tiny nanocrystal called hemozoan. And so it's important to note that this is basically an iron-based nanocrystal. So any, any physicist in the audience kind of see where this is going. Um, and then hemozoin is released into circulation um, when the red blood cell is broken into little pieces. So hemozoin uh, is paramagnetic. Um, and it is very strongly paramagnetic, unlike all other uh, materials that are naturally occurring in the blood. Um, it's also opaque and biofringent, so it has all kinds of interesting properties that make it a useful biomarker. 
uh, because there are not that many birefringent uh, materials in the blood. Um, it's elongated, rod-shaped, about 200 nanometers to a micron. Um, obviously, it's the production of hemozoans not well regulated by the red blood cell, so there's a little bit of variation in length. Um, and uh, chemists have come up with a really good hemozone mimic um, that has the same unit crystal and the same magnetic and optical properties. And that mimic is called beta hematin. Um, there are five different types of uh, malaria parasites, and all five produce hemozoan. Um, and the shape of the hemozoan is very similar among all five. So it truly proves and provides a good uh, potential biomarker for a screen. Um, obviously, it wouldn't be able to differentiate between the different types of malaria, but it would be a good basis for a screen, which then brings us to the point, why haven't people done this before? And they have. Uh, so there's been a polarization-based measurement. Um, so you look for the side scatter and flow cytometry, and then there's also a magneto-optics measurement, um, which relied on a, a magnet that was a few Tesla. And they basically looked at having a, you know, a no magnetic field applied, so it was randomly oriented, and then they would switch on the magnetic field, and then all the hemozone would become perfectly oriented, and then they would look for a change in either the biofringence or the polarization, and they would do this in some cases using dark field imaging, and they were able to get down to like single hemozone detection. Um, but all of this gets to questions of like, is this realistic? Um, for the type of environment that you want to actually detect malaria in? And also, is this really necessary? Uh, do you need to be able to detect like one hemozone particle? Like what do you actually need in the real world? So our goal, um, we kind of took a step back. Our goal was to have low initial and operating costs, um, easy maintenance, right? So a large free space optical setup or, a you know, for Tesla magnet don't really fall into that easy maintenance category. Um, and low size, weight, and power requirements, also known as low swap requirements. And then rugged operation. So something that you could uh, you know, easily carry around in a backpack. So taking kind of a step back, um, we started thinking about maybe optical spectroscopy. You know, maybe we could use that as a platform. Maybe we would need to add in a little variant, but maybe we could at least start with optical spectroscopy. And optical spectroscopy works by monitoring the power transmission through a sample. So you start off with a certain amount of, of optical power, and then your sample will scatter or absorb a certain amount of that power, and then you measure the power out. And then by comparing the power in to the power out, you're able to analyze your sample. And this approach, is used to analyze all types of liquid samples, um, as well as solid samples. Uh, so it's used to analyze the surface plasma resonance of nanoparticles. It's used to look at changes in uh, different types of photoresponsive polymer materials in their solid phase. So it's a very well understood system, especially for looking at uh, materials in transparent solvents. Uh, the problem is that if you want to look at blood, uh, suddenly the problem or the challenge becomes much more complex. Um, so blood is a very complex media. Uh, it co is comprised of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, so a whole range of cell types, plus the plasma. And the plasma is about 91% water, 7% blood pl proteins, and then 2% other things. And other things can be nutrients, hormones, electrolytes, wastes. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in blood. Uh, and then also that can vary uh, depending on the person, depending on the time of day. Uh, so for example, the ab absorptivity of your blood will change if you go for a run because you will become dehydrated. And then the amount of water so that 91 percent water will change uh so you can't even just you know establish what a normal is for a person and then use that is their normal because that will fluctuate and that will give you a huge error in your measurement so all of this variability must be accounted for and is incredibly challenging
So we needed to come up with a way to be able to use whole blood, but still take into account this variability and have it not completely destroy our measurement. So we decided to do something called differential spectroscopy. Um, and in this approach, we basically remove that variability as a variable. Um, so we're going to take two measurements, and we're going to take one with the magnet and one without a magnet. So the magnet allows us to basically remove all of the hemozoan from the blood. And then by taking and just doing a comparison with and without the magnet, the fact that the blood has all this variability, we're basically ground. So as an example, uh, how our system works is we start off taking a measurement down here um, with you know, normal blood without the magnet present. And so we're going to be capturing all the absorptivity of all of those different materials. Um, and then when we apply a magnet, oops, and then when we apply a magnet, if there's no hemozoan present, we would expect to have absolutely no change. It would just continue to be the same. If there is hemozoan present, the hemozoan will slowly begin to move out of our optical beam and we'll see an increase in transmission. Um, because all the hemozoan that's scattering light will no longer be there. And so then, you know, that variability, there is no variability because it's a single sample. So our first system was very uh, entertaining. Um, it was uh, very much put together with different parts that we happened to have hanging around in the lab. Um, but it worked. Uh, so it had a light source, a cuvette, it had a magnet on a, on a swinging stage, and a detector. Um, but we were able to get a signal. Uh, but it didn't meet any of our actual goals um, of having low operating costs, because the whole thing was mounted on an operating, on an optical breadboard. Um, it had very high maintenance, right, because you had to, you know, constantly align two optical fibers. Um, the swap costs were very high, and the ruggedness was non-existent. Um, so after many iterations, um, we were able to reduce the sample volume um, by basically optimizing the laser spot. Um, we increased our detector size so that the alignment became incredibly simple because we had a large spot. Um, we obviously had a remaining major issue in that this, this system was on a 10 by 12 uh, breadboard, which wasn't really necessary because we were only mounting three optical components. So we didn't need a breadboard. So then our final system, we simply 3D printed an optical or a, a plate that had three holes in it and that we could directly mount our components on. Um, so this really reduced a lot of the costs. It made it a lot more rugged, uh, made it a lot lighter weight, um, and it made the whole system a lot, you know, more portable. Um, there's still, you know, some improvements we need to do related to our sample volume um, and that we're working on. So throughout this whole process, obviously with each iteration, we did a lot of trials. For the most part, we were working with just iron oxide nanoparticles. Um, around version 5, we switched to working with uh, rabbit um, samples. And then with a version 7, um, we started working with actual hemozoan from non-human primates. And I'll focus today on the rabbit samples. The non-human primate samples were still kind of in progress. Um, so uh, the validation in blood um, with the rabbit samples... Uh, so how we actually made these samples, I'm going to take a step back. Um, we took a whole rabbit blood sample. We treated it with ultrasound. And the ultrasound treatment was to lyse the red blood cells in, in the white blood cells. So it was really important to take these very large blood cells, break them into a bunch of little pieces uh, so that they aren't scattering light. Um, if they're scattering a lot of light, then that creates a large noise in the signal. But by using ultrasound, uh, it is basically a very easy approach that doesn't require any reagents. Um, an alternative method of lysing cells you can use is soap. Um, so soap is equally uh, as effective as ultrasound. Um, but we really wanted to come up with a way that people could do sample treatment 
that wouldn't involve um, additional reagents that could go bad. Um, and ultrasound is very effective, but soap also works like regular dish soap. Um, then we added beta hematin at known concentration. So we basically dosed our samples. Um, and then 500 microliters, which is about five to seven drops, um, is tested. And so then we were able to get um, very clear uh, response curves. Um, so the base level noise in our system was very low. Um, and then as we gradually increased these concentrations, um, you can see that the noise increased a little bit, uh, but it was still, uh, you know, it fell within the predicted uh, error range of our model. So we also developed a model that was related to basically the uh, expected range in the beta hematin particle size, as well as their diffusion within the size of our laser beam. And so that kind of gave us like an upper and lower bound on exactly the change in uh, signal we would expect to see. And our model fell within, or our experimental data fell within that for the most part. There were a couple outliers. Um, and then we looked at reproducibility. So in our system, um, the entire like closed box system, our sample shaker, we put on a motorized stage such that we could do a measurement and then it could shake the sample and then we could do another measurement and then shake the sample and do another measurement. And so we did multiple measurements and we're able to get fairly reproducible data, um, which we felt was important because being able to reproduce and reanalyze the same sample multiple times gives you a certain amount of confidence in your actual measurement. Um, then we looked at, you know, what is the lowest limit of detection we can actually reliably detect? Um, and the lowest limit of detection was around eight nanograms per milliliter. And keep in mind, this was, you know, uh, the beta hematin in whole blood. Um, so it wasn't beta hematin in some sort of solvent. Um, so it was beta hematin in whole blood. And this correlates to about 26 parasites per milliliter. Um, so this was, you know, sub 100 parasites per milliliter. So th this was in like the ideal working range. Um, one challenge is that this this did require um, 500 uh, microliters of blood, and we really need to get down to 200 microliters in order to really push the non-human primate trial forward. And getting down to 200 microliters requires redesigning the entire system, um, which means redoing all of these measurements. So this is a huge... Um, undertaking that we're doing now. So we're redesigning everything. Um, so part of the reason why uh, a redesign is necessary, just for your information. Um, so when you do a non-human primate trial, there is a limit on the quantity of blood you can take from a non-human primate that you take on a daily basis. And so if we need 500 microliters, then that means we can only take a sample once a week. If we can get to 200 microliters, then that means we can take daily samples. So it's significantly more data. Uh, and then we'll have significantly more confidence in the quality of our data and the accuracy. So personally, I feel it's worth it to do the whole system redesign. So now continuing uh, with kind of the last project, which is the UVC system. Um, and I'll give kind of a brief background and mechanism before going into our work. Um, so first I want to emphasize that, that this work is not kind of in our normal, uh, range of activities, but it was really inspired by, uh, kind of a need that our, that the USC medical school and medical, uh, enterprise had. Um, so normally, uh, a hospital, you know, needs lots of things. Uh, so they need PPE, they need instrumentation, um, they need materials, and all of these needs are able to be met by companies and industries. Um, and then, uh, you know, during COVID-19, suddenly a lot of these healthcare needs were not able to be met. Um, and so either uh, engineering community kind of stepped up and met them, or we came up with different ways to reuse the existing PPE. And that's kind of where this project came into play, um, is that the... Uh, CEO, so the person in charge of the USC a medical enterprise, emailed all the engineers and asked for help. 
And so kind of the first big picture question is, you know, what is the difference between cleaning a surface, uh, disinfecting a surface and sterilizing a surface? Because a lot of times these words are used interchangeably. Um, so when you disinfect a surface, you remove all harmful organization or organisms. So you remove viruses, you remove bacteria, but non-pathogenic materia or material usually aren't removed. Then when you sterilize a surface, all organisms are removed. So viruses, bacteria, and non-pathogenic material. So sterilizing is much more rigorous than disinfection. Uh, we were focusing on just making something that would disinfect a surface uh, because that was, you know, that would be sufficient. Um, so that was our goal. So there are lots of different approaches for viral uh, cleaning. Um, in this case, when you look at a viral structure and kind of the key uh, elements that allow it to function, there are five. Um, so there's the spike protein, um, which allows it to identify a target. There's the nucleocapsid, which allows the um, nucleus and RNA protein to actually be stable. There's the RNA viral genome, which, you know, defines what the virus is and what its function is and how aggressive it is. There's the envelope protein, which uh, provides stability to the viral membrane. And then there's a viral membrane, which like holds the whole thing together and protects it from the outside environment. So by targeting any of these things, you can destroy the virus. By targeting multiples of these things, you can destroy it more effectively. Um, so kind of the goal around pretty much all disinfection mechanisms is to target one or more of these things. Um, so there are three main classes. So there's chemical, thermal, and radiation. Uh, so chemical is kind of your classic, you know, bleach or hydrogen peroxide. Um, they all target the S protein and the envelope protein. So they're basically targeting that outer shell. Uh, then you have thermal, which are going to be things like um, heat treatments in ovens, uh, furnaces. Um, they're targeting uh, the S protein and the envelope protein as well. And then you have radiation. And radiation is everything from microwave to x-ray, as well as UVC. And radiation, it really depends on what wavelength. So it can target RNA or it can target the S protein and envelope depending on which wavelength you're looking at. Um, so for UVC, UVC targets the RNA. And how does UVC do this? Um, so UVC actually targets the pyrimidine groups. Um, so how it does this is, and it, it's important to emphasize that it does this for both DNA and RNA, um, which makes it kind of a broad spectrum um, way of cleaning surfaces. So it's not just for viruses, it's for both viruses and bacteria. Um, but it, it targets it by changing how they actually bind together. So if you remember, uh, guanine binds to cytosine, adenine binds to thymine or uracil. So if you're able to change how those base pairs bind together, then you will disrupt replication. And then if you disrupt replication, then you basically disrupt uh, the ability of the virus to infect. So when you expose either DNA or RNA to UVC, instead of having nice uniform structure of a, of a backbone, of an RNA backbone, then the uh, guanine and cytosine will bind to each other along the backbone instead of binding outwards. Um, and they, so this is something called a dimer. So when they dimerize, they're no longer able to replicate. So this causes things like transcription errors. And then these transcription errors will ultimately result in viral death or bacterial death. Uh, so it, it's kind of far up in the cascade. It's not, it's not like targeting the S protein or targeting the cell membrane and disrupting the entire virus immediately. So this is more like one step back. Um, but it has the same ultimate effect. So there are lots of UVC disinfection approaches. Um, so there's what I like to call the UVC oven, 
Um, so it looks like a little microwave oven, um, except instead of a microwave source, it has a UVC source. Um, it's really good for uh, like cleaning, like small medical appliances, small medical tools. Uh, it's present in a lot of dentist offices. Uh, so the problem is that they have a fixed source for replacement parts like the UVC bulbs. And this became a problem in the spring, at least in the US, uh, because the bulbs were very hard to get. Um, then there's also biosafety cabinets and having an integrated UVC source in the biosafety cabinet and turning it on when the system is not in use is like standard practice in most bio labs. Um, and actually there was a group at uh, Cedars in the US that figured out uh, the exact protocol necessary to repurpose the biosafety cabinets to clean PPE. Um, so, but biosafety cabinets are primarily used in a research setting. This isn't their normal job. And then robotic systems have kind of like come to the forefront recently uh, as a way to clean large spaces. Um, so they're like kind of like the automatic vacuum system, but with a whole like tower of UVC, of vertically uh, mounted UVC bulbs. Um, Again, very high intensity UVC bulbs and designed to clean like a large space and kind of roam around a large space. Um, one important thing to note about UVC is that it um, can cause a lot of diseases if you are directly exposed to it, just like it can uh, destroy RNA and DNA, it can destroy the RNA and DNA on you, um, and particularly in your eyes. Uh, so it's important to be very careful if you're working with UVC. Um, so the reason why at least USC was really interested in this, um, and particularly right now because we're in Los Angeles, um, is that the kind of the conventional way of addressing uh, disinfection is that in a hospital, um, it, it is very much like a spoke and a wheel uh, configuration. So you have kind of the primary spot where all sterilization and disinfection is performed and then all the kind of rooms or wards are uh, situated out from that so kind of all of these yellow circles represent you know where an operating room might be an icu different patient rooms so then uh you know laundry or whatever supplies kind of get taken to that central spot um However, currently, um, this kind of nice ordered architecture is getting disrupted uh, because there are now off-site spots, um, which you know may not be located with the primary spot. And therefore, this pathway may involve travel in cars. So examples of this um, are happening globally. Uh, so, for example, you know, there are hospital beds being set up, you know, in, uh, you know, arenas, in parks, um, in gyms. So it's important to be able to have on-site approaches for cleaning services as opposed to relying on kind of these already well-built infrastructures. Also, the already well-built infrastructures are simply getting overwhelmed. There's more uh, cleaning that needs to be done than normal. So the hospital gave us kind of a set of key design criteria, um, and these included, you know, creating a lightweight, inexpensive system that we could make a lot of really fast, um, and that could be used to create this kind of distributed network. Um, and that was one of the, you know, metrics that also went into that lightweight, so that, you know, as the distributed network needed to be moved, they could carry them around. Um, they gave us a set of quantitative metrics, uh, so they wanted the systems to be able to reach certain UVC intensities. Um, and obviously we needed to validate them. So they gave us a validation metric. Um, so our first system, um, you know, when you're given this set of goals, you should come up with kind of the first system that's super simple. So we just took a UVC bulb mounted mm -hmm. on the side of a, of a large box. Um, and it was a large lightweight plastic bin. And this whole system cost about $40, so we could make a lot of them. Um, and then we kind of began thinking this, rethinking this. So this, the black, right, is obviously very absorbing. So one super simple improvement is simply to, oops, 
simply to coat the inside with a very reflective coating. Um, so when you think about what types of materials you're going to coat that are going to be reflective, you want to coat with something that's reflective for UVC light. And aluminum is very highly reflective in the UVC wavelength range. And chrome spray paint is primarily aluminum. So we used chrome spray paint to get that super smooth aluminum coating. Um, and so effectively, this creates a fabry perot type cavity. So we did a little bit of uh, modeling um, in order to get uh, kind of rough calculations on how long we should put a sample in there in order to get that dose, that gold dose um, intensity. And, you know, based on assuming uh, either 25 or an 85 percent reflectivity, because remember, aluminum actually has 90 percent reflectivity theoretically. Um, so if we did either, if we assumed a 25% reflectivity or an 85% reflectivity with a one minute exposure time, we should have over 100 millijoules per centimeter squared throughout the box. Obviously, it's going to be, you know, nonlinear exposure throughout the box. But, you know, even in, you know, like the farthest corner here, it's still over 100. So just for comparison, um, in our work, we used a 15 watt bulb, um, but obviously on the market, you can buy different bulb types. You can buy 10 watt, you know, up to 18 watt. They're fairly similar prices. Um, and then, uh, so theoretically you should be able to achieve, you know, hundred millijoule per centimeter squared with only one minute exposure. And that one minute of exposure was a really key metric that the hospital wanted because all of their current UVC systems had a one minute exposure as the uh, standard operating procedure. So they, they wanted to be able to give their current technicians a system that had the same protocol. Um, and then for comparison, uh, these are kind of four you know, common bacteria or viruses that you know, most people know about. And all of these have uh, 100 millijoule per uh, centimeter squared or much lower um, in order to uh, remove them. Um, so that's kind of where that 100 number comes from. It's from all of these. And what I found interesting when I was looking at these numbers, because I was new to this, um, like anthrax is actually lower than an adenovirus, which, which I thought was interesting. I didn't know that. Um, okay, so as our test system, um, so when we first started doing this, the hospital was really focusing on being able to reuse plastic face shields. Um, so we didn't want to take and cut up a plastic face shield into a bunch of little pieces. So we used a sterile plastic Petri dish because it's made out of the same material. Um, and then we used uh, Bacillus cereus as a test system. Um, so Bacillus cereus is a gram-positive endospore-forming UV-resistant uh, bacteria, which basically means it is an incredibly hard uh, bacteria to be able to kill using UV. Um, we then verified that we actually had the bacteria that we wanted with MALDI. Um, then we plated it on the sterile Petri dishes. Uh, we performed a series of exposures. So we did no exposure as our control. Uh, we did different exposure time. And we also placed the dishes at different locations in the box. Um, then after exposure, we transferred it to an agar coated plate um, and let it grow in an incubator for 24 hours and uh, then uh, counted the colony forming units. So our controls, so our no treatment grew very, very well. Um, our uh, one minute exposure when it was on one of the edges, we got a little bit of growth, um, but either the middle or the other edge, we got no growth. And again, um, even with the little bit of growth, it was still over a three log reduction. And then uh, three minutes, we saw no growth. And again, even with the six minute, we saw like a little bit of growth on one of the edges, but pretty much no growth. So it didn't really matter which time we still saw a three log reduction. Um, and so they decided to go with the three minute exposure, even though there was a little bit of exposure at six minutes. Um, this was kind of viewed as being an experimental error, um, maybe had to do with how we 
scraped it off the bottom. I don't know. Um, but they went with the three minute. So then obviously there's a lingering question that was kind of out in the field at this point in time, which was, uh, does UVC impact the filtration efficiency of PPE? Um, so we used our system to actually study this. And we worked with a group at Caltech uh, that focuses on uh, filtration efficiency and measuring filtration efficiency. So how this works is they take a mask, um, they mount it on a dummy, they actually put a wax, a, a wax seal around the edges of the mask. Um, and so that makes sure that no particles kind of in the chamber can like sneak in the sides. Um, they flow in, you know, particles of a fixed size. They chose particles at and above 300 nanometers for this test. And they have a specific flow rate. In this case, they use 22 liters per minute. So pretty fast. So really trying to like force the particles into the mask. Um, we did two types of measurements on two uh, KN95 masks. So the first measurement, and my cat's about to appear. Sorry. Um, so the first measurement um, was a three minute exposure of the mask. Um, and then the filtration rate was measured. And then we repeated this process 40 times. So on the same mask. So we basically repeatedly exposed the same mask for three minutes, 40 times. Then uh, the second measurement, we took those masks that had already been exposed 40 times and did a pair of continuous, really long exposures. Um, and after each, each single long exposure, we measured the filtration efficiency. Um, and as you can see, the filtration efficiency versus UV treatment time didn't really change. Um, so neither the short term or the long term times really affected the filtration efficiency and really the difference between the multiple short term or the long term. We thought maybe during the long term, the mask would get hot and that might degrade the filtration efficiency, but that didn't happen. Um, and after, you know, many long term, you know, treatments, like no one's going to want to wear this mask again, um, which is why we stopped. Um, now, UVC, obviously, you know, COVID, hopefully, someday is going to end. Um, and we're, you know, thinking UVC at that point is going to start being used for things like uh, cleaning surfaces of bacteria, uh, because antibacterial resistance is becoming an increasing threat. Um, so UVC isn't going to just go away. And, you know, wearing masks isn't going to just go away, even though we all hope it will. Um, so, you know, so far, we've talked about portable diagnostics and UVC disinfection, and I welcome any questions. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. We, we had three topics in one talk, so we're <laughs> really lucky. Uh, we also get to know your cat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it was nice. <laughs> um, so I guess there are some uh, uh, questions um, uh, from Jilali uh, uh, Benchik. Is it possible to acquire the PowerPoint? <laughs> this is your <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I, I think the video is going to be saved, and I can definitely send the PowerPoint if you send me an email. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yes, it will be I the, the talk are registered also, so yeah. Cecile, you want to say something, maybe? Yes, I just say that um, we record the, the video, so it will be possible to have it. Thank you, Andrea, for that. Okay. Um, so maybe waiting for uh, some uh, questions from the audience. Um, I can begin with uh, two questions. I would like to come back with your first uh, topic mm -hmm. uh, because I found it very interesting and I understand your goal is to obtain a library of um, biomechanical properties of different organs. Uh, mm -hmm. but uh, healthy and uh, during uh, disease. Um, if I understand correctly, 
uh, up to now you are recording these uh, properties ex vivo and um, I wanted to know uh, how do you manage to keep the samples since uh, I guess that the, um, the degree of uh, hydration is, uh, is very mm -hmm. important uh, for yeah. the mechanical properties. Yeah, no, the uh, the sample, so this is actually one reason why we've had, like, our human trials are going so slow. Um, mm -hmm. So the sample stability is very hard. Um, so when we do uh, the sample measurements, um, we basically have a really strict protocol. So we, in some of the initial trials with the animal samples, we did a really systematic study on looking at how the mechanical properties changed over time. So we did measurements every 30 minutes for 48 hours. And I and I have to give um, my PhD students credit for that because it was every 30 minutes for 48 hours. So they took shifts on that. Um, but we found uh, we could actually detect uh, the samples degrading, right? The en enzymatic activity kicking up and... Um, and so we found we could reproducibly get measurements if we took the if we took measurements within about two hours after resecting from the animal. Um, but if we waited, you know, somewhere between two and three hours, then the samples began to change, and it kind of depended on the animal and the health of the animal to start. Um, and so we we basically set a protocol that that we have to take measurements within two hours of resection. Um, because exactly what you're saying, like they're, they're living samples, right? Even though it's, it's a piece of tissue you've resected, the cells are still alive. Um, mm -hmm. and, and now you've taken them out. And so they're no longer actively getting nutrients and, and they start degrading. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, on the same uh, topic, um, the strain you are applying, uh, <laughs> Are they uh, always in the same direction, or can you change from compression to tension to torsion or things like yeah. that? So our current system is only compression. We could look at like shear. Um, we can't pull. Okay. Yeah. So we can't do tension. Um, we can do shear. Uh, but but we we've, we're mainly focusing on compression. What we have done. Um, and we haven't, I don't think we've published it, uh, but we have some, some, some measurements with uh, heart. Um, so heart is a really interesting organ in the sense that the, the cells, because it is a muscle, right? In muscle tissue, the cell structure is very well aligned, unlike something like kidney or pancreas. Uh, but heart, the, the muscle tissue is very well aligned and the density of the, of the muscle changes depending on where you are in the heart. And so we can actually pick up that change in density and also how the structure is changing depending on which part of the heart you're looking at. Um, so we have looked at that at how the, the heart is different in different parts. Um, but so far it's been in healthy heart because obviously we can't yeah. do that in people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. So I see there is a, a question on the chat from uh, Natalia Della Um For how long did your did the, your research group work on the UVC um, disinfection uh, project? Mm -hmm. uh, three weeks. Oh, okay, so very. Yeah. Uh, no, it was. Yeah. With impressive yes. results already. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. It was. Uh, we did that in March. Um, so what happened is the, the CEO of the medical school, um, basically sent an email to all the engineering faculty that read something like help, um, like we need help. What can you do? We need all the PPE you have. Um, and I'm in charge of the nanofabrication facility. So I have all of the PPE, um, so I sent all of the PPE for our nanofab to the medical school. Um, and then I emailed back and said, you know, do you need anything else? Like, what else can I give you? Um, 
And he emailed back and said, well, we'd really like to have a UVC disinfection system because we have, we, they had three, but they wanted more. Mm -hmm. And so I said, sure, I'll build some. What, like, but what do you need? Um, and I think he thought I was joking. Uh, like I wasn't being like, I wasn't actually going to do this. Uh, but I, my husband, uh, has a company. He's also an engineer, but he has a company. And so my students and I designed it and did the first prototype. And then once we had a prototype and we'd validated it with the medical school's biochemistry team that actually does all the pathology for the hospital, uh, then my husband's company manufactured them. So they, we, yeah, we transferred it to them and they manufactured like 40 or 60 and donated them to like all the hospitals in LA. Yeah, so when it's needed, the administrative part can be very, very rapid. Yeah, yeah. And so it's the same here in France, but <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So it was, it was, th it was three weeks. Like the whole, it was just three weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, and well, the manufacturing part was very fast because, um, like my husband's company, like all the all the engineers at my husband's company were willing to work overtime to make them. Right. So they, they were working in the evenings and the weekends to make them and then distribute them. Um, so everything just went very fast. Um, it's, it's the fastest project I've ever done. Um, but it was, yeah. 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 Impressive. So is there any other question from uh, the audience? Uh, I just check if someone is rising a uh, hand. I was going to say, I, I don't want to go over. I know I like almost went over. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if you send me an email, I can send the slides. That, that's not a problem. Okay. That's very yeah. nice to Oh, you. and my, my, yeah, my email address is on my website, which is at the bottom of this slide. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to discuss with you uh, again for with um, this uh, biomechanical properties. I think this is very interesting. Also, trying to link them with some uh, biochemical markers, probably, mm -hmm. but the uh, a long way process. So maybe we will still have uh, new opportunities. So with this um, and. Uh, um, in the name of everybody, I would like to thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Very early. Yeah, and, and and I hope to be able to come visit in person sometime. Yeah. I'm I'm very I'm very envious of the previous speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Many thanks. That was very impressive. Thank you.